God bless each and every one of you. May he lift your spirits today, give you strength. May you be reminded of his love and his power. As we're praying for our children, we're just praying for ourselves too. All of us a bit whipsawed by 2020, trying to work our way through it, but God bless you. Here you are breathing and believing. We're going to keep praying as we uh, should and can uh, for the healing of our nation, healing of our city. This coming Saturday, there is a uh, special prayer service beginning at 3 p.m. at San Pedro Park. We're actively involved in this. In fact, Travis and I will both be participating. Uh, if you'd like to come in person, you can find information at praysa.org. Praysa.org. You do need to register if you come in person. And also, if you'd like to watch online, you can find the link at praysa.org, also at maxlocato.com. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to open your word. Have mercy on our speaker. His sins are many. Thank you that we can be here today. Through Christ we pray. Amen. I have two questions that I would like to bring up in heaven. Not complaints, mind you. There will be no complaints in heaven. There may not even be questions. But if there are, I have two issues, two topics for which I could appreciate some clarity. Mosquitoes <laughs> and middle school. Were either one really necessary? <laughs> wouldn't the world, wouldn't life have been better off without them? Those blood-sucking varmints <laughs> and those awkward in-between years of middle school. I was a nerd in middle school. I mean a serious nerd. <laughs> I had a sum total of two friends which was fine because they were nerds as well. We were so nerdy, hang on to your hats, we carried pocket protectors. We played with a slide rule. Many of you don't even know what a slide rule is. It was a precursor to whatever's used today to calculate things. We sat on the front row of every class and we had competition to see who could make the best grade. I told you I was a nerd. When Dean Lynn met me, she said, you're gonna have to go through a nerdaholics program. <laughs> Hi, I'm Max, I study every night. I was a nerd, I was a nerd. And that was fine with me until one of the nerds moved away with his family and the other nerd got a paper route, and I didn't see much of him. So as quickly as a person could say solitary, I was. I had one thing going for me. I was pretty good at baseball. Good enough to convince my dad to convince me to try out for the Pony League baseball team. Now, Pony League, at least in our day, was that league of baseball that came in between little league elementary school and high school so it was comprised of be pimpled gangly awkward kids like me who could play baseball well I went out for the team lo and behold I made one I got picked that's the good news the bad news is every other player on the team was cool I mean, they walked the walk, they wore the classy clothes, they knew the music to listen to, they had the lingo down, and I just was so scared. I mean, not only was I a nerd, I was a rookie. Well, the first day of practice came about uh, during the month of March. Yes, I still recall it to this day. I talk to my therapist about it often. <laughs> just kidding. It was cold. You know how Texas can have that unpredictable March weather. A blue norther came raging out of the panhandle. 
And what should have been a delightful spring day saw winds of at least 10, 15 mile an hour and a dip in temperature down in the 30s. It was bitterly cold. Not the kind of day you want to be on a baseball diamond. To keep me warm, my mom handed me a sweatshirt. I put it on in the car as my dad was driving me to practice. And I looked down and I saw the emblem on the sweatshirt. Abilene Christian College, as it was called then. My sisters, two older sisters, had already attended and graduated from Abilene Christian. I was destined to do the same. Hence, the family owned the sweatshirt. I was mortified. How could I introduce myself to a bunch of cool guys with the name Christian on my sweatshirt? Cool kids aren't Christian. Cool baseball players aren't Christian. University of Texas, maybe. A&M, maybe. But Christian. And again, I was already the rookie. I was already the loner. I was already nervous. So what I did with that sweatshirt that day might very well cause you to defrock me and send me into retirement. When dad dropped me off at the practice field, I waited until the car was out of view and I peeled off the sweatshirt. And I wadded it up in a ball and I hid it at the base of the backstop. I shivered throughout the workout. I decided I'd rather be left out in the cold than left out by my friends. So to fit in, I hid my faith. No, I'm not proud of that. The Apostle Paul was speaking to middle school version of Max when he said, do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We all have a choice. We can be conformed or be transformed. We can be conformed to fit in to society or we can be transformed to be more like Christ. And on that day, in that occasion, I chose to wad up the shirt. Mordecai and Esther did the same. They disguised their identity. They chose to fit in rather than stand out. They conformed. And as we move into chapter 2 of our study of the book of Esther, it might surprise you to hear me say that. After all, Mordecai and Esther, they're heroes in the Bible. Esther is a female version of Daniel, stable and solid during a time of exile. Mordecai steel-spined, refusing to bow before Haman. A Paul Revere of Scripture. They never wavered. They never floundered. They never shirked their duty. They saved the Jewish nation for crying out loud. They protected the nation from a certain holocaust. They deserve a spot on the Hebrew version of Mount Rushmore. They took a courageous stand. Indeed, they did but not before they didn't. Bible characters are complex. They aren't really those felt figures that we sometimes use in Bible classes for children that are single dimensional, that fit inside a box. They are multi-dimensional. And Moses was a murderer before he was a liberator. Uh, Joseph was a punk before he was a prince. Yes, the apostle Peter preached the greatest sermon in all of history on the day of Pentecost, but that was only a little more than 50 days after he had actually denied Jesus Christ three times with foul language. The people of the Bible were exactly that. They were people. They were people, complex, with emotions, with battling loyalties, 
And sometimes they were rock solid and inspirational. But sometimes they were known to wad up a sweatshirt and forget their identity. Now keep in mind that the original purpose of the book of Esther was and still is for the Jews to be read as a narrative, just like we read the Christmas story every December to remind us of the birth of Christ, and it's a wonderful tradition. And so the, the Hebrews would read and read the story of Esther every year at the holiday called Purim. And so to understand the book of Esther, we we should listen to it, at least attempt to do so, through the ears of Jewish exiles. Because the book was written to, to inspire exiles, to stay strong as they were dispersed out of Jerusalem, to remain faithful to their call and not to forget their identity. And so we are wise to imagine the reaction of the first Hebrew listeners as they were introduced to the two main characters. The first one is Mordecai. Mordecai. He's a Jew with a pagan name. Here's how he's introduced. Now, there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Among those taken captive with King Jehoiakim, with Jehoiakim, king of Judah. We would read that paragraph and maybe make a comment about how difficult some of those names are to pronounce. But outside of that, we wouldn't arch an eyebrow or ask a question. But the Jews, trained in the ways of the Torah, taught to cherish their identity as God's covenant people, this paragraph would arch a few eyebrows and raise some questions. For example, what's a Jew doing living in the citadel of Susa? The city of Susa, the outlying areas, was one thing. But to live in the citadel was to live right in the heart of the decision-making power, the, the castle, if you will, the Capitol Hill, if you will, of Susa. And Mordecai not only lived in the citadel, look at this. He was on duty at the palace. He worked for the king. He made a living off a pagan king. Again, you and I, 2,500 years removed, 1,000 pages of history removed, we hear about that and we say, way to go, Mordecai. Way to be industrious. Way to make it with the big guy. You're on the payroll of Xerxes. But to be a Jew, first and foremost, to be a Jew was to be called out, to be set apart as a covenant people. But here Mordecai was on the payroll of a pagan king. Even worse, his name is Mordecai. That's not a Jewish name. Mordecai comes from the name Marduk, M-A-R-D-U-K, who was a pagan god. This would be similar to a Jew naming his son Mohammed today. Would a God-fearing Jew work for Xerxes, have a name that made people think about a pagan god, it'd be like a Jew working in the Iranian military today. That's not likely. So what in the world is going on? Well, part of the explanation is found in those difficult names that are difficult to pronounce at the top of the... Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother had died. Hadassah 
comes from the Hebrew word myrtle, and it places in the Old Testament the myrtle tree or plant is a connotation for that which is righteous. And so Hadassah fits, because we all know if you read the story, Hadassah did some righteous things, but we got to scratch our heads at this Esther, which comes from the name Ishtar, which is the name of a pagan goddess. Marduk, Ishtar, Mordecai, Esther, what in the world is going on here? How did she get the name? And how do we explain the decision of Mordecai to enter Esther into the contest to be the queen of Persia? You remember from chapter 1. Queen Vashti got the boot when she refused to behave like a trophy wife for Xerxes. And upon the recommendation of his advisors, the king Xerxes solicited all the young beauties of Persia to, look at this, become a part of his harem. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many young women were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Haggai, Esther was also taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. She pleased him and won his favor. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. Questions just keep adding up. So we have this Jewish girl with a pagan name who looks so beautiful she could be on the cover of a magazine, but she was as Jewish as the Torah. Even so, Mordecai, who worked for the king, entered her in a star search contest that the king had sponsored, knowing Mordecai knew that the competition included a knight in the bed of a Gentile king. He told her, show him a good time, keep your nationality a secret. What in the world is going on here? A little bit of context will help. The Babylonians, I'm sorry, the Persians, like the Babylonians before them, allowed their conquered peoples to keep worshiping whatever god they worshiped back in their homeland. You could worship the snake, you could worship the tiger, you could worship the dog, you could worship the star, as long as you, in addition, worshiped the Persian gods. So they weren't anti-worship. They just wanted multiple worships. Now, that might not have been a problem for some conquered peoples, but for the Hebrews, that was a big deal, right? I mean, every Jew who had tasted a piece of matzah bread, knew the most common, most famous scripture in the Torah. Listen, people of Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, not part of it, all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. It was in the Ten Commandments to have no other gods before the true and living God. So this was problematic for people. In fact, there's a question in the book of Psalms. It's really the question of the book of Esther. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? I mean, it's one thing to do it back in Israel, but it's another thing to do it under Babylonian rule or Persian rule. Little by little, year by year, decade by decade, generation by generation, it's easier and easier just to fit in. Just to blend in, not to stand out. Change your ways, change your name, change from a Hebrew name to a Persian name. Why risk in angering the king? I can worship the Persian gods and my God, right? I can change my name and make a good living for the, off the king, right? I can keep my identity a secret and sleep with the king, right? So by the time we meet Mordecai and Esther in the early pages of the book, oh, they're a compromised people. 
Which brings to mind another question that I'd like to ask in heaven, along with the question about the middle school and the mosquitoes. I'd like to sit down with Mordecai and just shoot straight with him. Why'd you do it, Mordecai? Why'd you change your name? Why'd you let him take your Hadassah? You knew what they'd do with her. She would be spruced up for one night and go to bed with a brute. And unless he chose her to be queen, she'd spend the rest of her life as a cloistered concubine. I'm thinking Mordecai is going to respond to me in one of two ways. I'm thinking he's going to look at me and say, Lakato, you weren't there. You weren't there. You don't know how crazy Xerxes was. He was a raging dictator, psychotic, moody, and paranoid. In this way, at least Esther, my precious Hadassah, at least this way she would be safe. That's why I told her, don't tell, tell anybody that you're a, a, of Jewish nationality. That's what I told her. I wanted her to be safe. Or he could say this, Locato, you don't get it. I worked at the palace on purpose. I made friends with Haggai, the head of the harem. I told him about her and her about him. This was a plan I had from the get-go. I wanted Esther to be safe, and so I positioned her. And that's why I told her to hide her nationality. If he knew she was a Jew, then again, he might look at me and say, Locato, who are you to question me about my decision? You're the one who took off the sweatshirt. And he'd be right to push back. Folks, all of us are tempted to assimilate. All of us are tempted to fit in, to blend in. Not in Persia, of course, but on the playground or at work, bowling league, pony league. We're tempted to be accepted, do anything to be accepted, to be a part of the gang, to be less Hadassah and more Esther, to be less a descendant of Abraham and more a Mordecai in the citadel of Susa. It's our identity, to forget our uniqueness, to dismiss God's call on your life and mine to be a unique covenant people. There's the temptation. It comes in a variety of forms. But the temptation is just blend in and fit in. God's word for such moments is simply this. Remember your name. Remember who you are. Can I tell you who you are? What marvelous love the Father has extended to us. Just look at it. We're called what, church? Children of God. We're called children of God. That's who we really are. But that's also why the world doesn't recognize us or take us seriously. <laughs> it has no idea. It has no idea who he is or what he's up to. But friends, that's exactly who we are. Children of God. And that's only the beginning who knows how we'll end up? What we know is that when Christ is openly revealed, we will see him. And in seeing him, we will become like him. Let me just quickly remind you who you are. You are justified. You are eternal. You are saintly. You are unique. You are secure. You are J-E-S-U-S. -S. You are Jesus. You are the living Jesus in this world. He has taken up residence within you. Be pimpled and gangly and middle schoolish. Far from it. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are chosen by the Almighty God. Your name is written in the only book that matters, and that is the book of life. And this life that we're leading on this earth is going to be over so briefly. And it does not matter a whip what people think about you. 
What matters most is what God thinks about you. And he thinks you're pretty special. You want to say amen behind your mask? I had a great reminder of my identity just a few weeks ago. My wife, Dean and I had the opportunity to visit the cemetery where my parents are buried. It's so easy to find their burial spot because it is the only grave, only tombstone that has near it a live oak tree. A live oak tree. My dad planted it himself. The cemetery has many trees, but only one live oak. I can't explain my dad's fascination with this species. They are not indigenous to West Texas. But for some reason, he took a liking to them, so much so that he planted one himself. He dug the hole and planted the tree over his burial spot. He was about 67 years of age. He had just been diagnosed with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. And wanting to get his house in order, one of the things he did was request and receive permission to plant that tree. I recall visiting the grave site with him some three and a half decades ago now. I recall how proud he was of that just planted tree. So skinny that tree was, just a sapling, so small. I could wrap my hand around it and touch thumb to finger. I've not seen the tree a lot over the last few years. But when Dinalyn and I stopped there in August, oh, I was impressed with how much it had grown. The tree is now as thick as a man's torso, and the branches extend far over the gravesite. But what's, what impressed me most was not the size of the tree, but what my dad had done to the tree. He had carved something into it and never told us about it. And I had never seen it until just a few weeks ago. He carved a heart in the tree. Now, when the tree was real small, the heart was so tiny, it was unnoticeable. But he knew as the tree grew, so would the heart. That rascal. And what's more, he not only carved a heart, but if you look really closely, you can detect the initials of his four children. I can just see him doing this with his pocket knife and just smiling all the while, thinking that, well, two, three, three and a half decades from now, they'll finally see it. And they will know that they had a place in my heart. Your father did the same. Not with a live oak tree, but with a cross. Not with a carving, but with the crimson blood of Jesus Christ. And as the years have passed, that heart has only grown. And look closely and you can see your name, your name written on the heart of your heavenly father. To the middle school version of Max, I think God would have said that. I think he would have said, care less about what people think. Care less about what the other kids think. Don't tune in to what they're saying and how they're acting. What matters is that I love you. And the cross is the reminder of the only love that matters. The love of people, the approval of people that comes and goes with the wind and the seasons. But my love for you will never, ever change. Do you need that reminder today? I'm not the only one who has had a sweatshirt moment. Right? You've had yours. 
and you will have yours. And when you have yours, I hope you'll remember that the story of Mordecai and Esther does not stop with chapter 2. Beginning in chapter 3, they're going to have a 5th century B.C. version of a come-to-Jesus moment. And they're going to take a stand. And they're going to pull that sweatshirt out and they're going to put it back on. And God, who loves to give his children a second chance, is going to put them right to work. But the story of Esther is made even richer when we realize that the heroes were folks like you and like me. I wish I could say that I had pulled out that sweatshirt in my middle school days and and put it back on, but I did not. I stood out there in left field, shivering cold. You know, sometimes we're left searching for springtime not because of God's choice, but because of our own misguided loyalties. Is it time for you to come in out of the cold? Heavenly Father, have mercy upon us as we read these stories, that we would receive them as you designed them to be received. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy that is so rich. And we do pray that this love would be the love that serves as our identity and that serves as our security. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.